Hey, what's up, everybody? The Political Brown Kid here, PBK. And I just want to talk about a topic here. Um, the topic that I want to talk about is how we've kind of adopted, um, when I say we, I'm talking about um, black people, black people throughout the diaspora, not really just here, because, again, I'm reporting here from the United States of America. But you can kind of look all over the world throughout the black diaspora, and you can see this um this issue occurring and, and it's not just something new that's just started to occur. This has really kind of happened since um, post slavery. And I know that we talk a lot about Jim Crow here in the United States. Everyone wants to mention Jim Crow, Jim Crow, Jim Crow. But what about Jamal Crow? What about Jada Crow? That's what I want to talk about today. Jim Crow. I mean, I'm not trying to say it's long gone. I'm not going to say that. I think Jim Crow's still around. I think segregation's still around. I think some form of kind of not really slavery, but a kind of paid slavery is still around. An apartheid system still exists throughout the black diaspora. But I want to talk about that self-imposed slavery, that self-imposed Jim Crow that we've adopted. And that's why I'm calling that Jamal Crow or Jada Crow. And again, you've heard this term invented right here, right here on Political Brown Kid. I've invented it. So if you have, so I don't care if you use it, but at least give me my props when you start saying Jamal Crow or Jada Crow. And that's just basically black people adopting Jim Crow type tactics against their own people and slavery type tactics. Those type of tactics um, that you know, really psychologically and financially damaged black people up to this day. So let's talk about it. And before we dive into it, let's let's look at the history of it. Like I said, Jamal Crow and Jada Crow is not anything new. It may be new to some people right now. It may be new to people who like Generation Zers, those who are just born in 2006. But listen, Howard University, my alma mater, and all of the other HBCUs that existed during the early days when they when they when they were around when they were formed founded, you can look through those yearbooks, and those yearbooks had all light skinned people, damn near look white. Those were the people who led us post slavery. Now let me let me say this before I kind of dive into, um get too deep into this discussion because I don't think I've addressed this in any of my other posts. And I do apologize for not addressing this one point that I'm about to make because it seems as though I'm kind of beating up on light skinned people and I'm not, and I'm not, I love my light skinned brothers and sisters. I love my light skinned brothers and sisters. I'm not going to hit y'all with that. Some of my best friends are light skinned. I'm not going to hit y'all with that, even though some of my best friends are, but what well, basically the point that I'm trying to make is because I'm not I'm not beating up on that. We love and, and embrace and accept y'all. Y'all are black. There's no doubt about that. And this is nothing against you guys. But this colorism issue we have to talk about. When you have brown skin and dark skin black girls being pitted against light skin black girls, and, and they're not being pitted against and, and white people are subtly doing it. They are. They're really doing it through their media. You can look at it and see. Watch your commercials. Watch your TV shows. Comedy Jogo, Halle Berry. Watch the girls who get the leading roles. But we're also doing it to ourselves in our own movies. And that's where the Jamal Crow or the Jada Crow comes in. Because the reason why I'm using Jada Crow too is because, yeah, you black women, you black women, you're self-imposing a lot of Jim Crow tactics. You're, you're self-imposing bed winching because a lot of you are doing it intentionally. You seeking, you actively seeking out white men, Tiffany Haddish. Yeah, you're, you're actively doing it, and and you're actively creating movies like The Hate You Give. That The Hate You Give was written by a black woman, and you know she could have written that about a love story between a, a black boy and a black girl, and then another black friend gets killed. But she tip, she intentionally wrote, "Hey, I'm gonna give her a white boyfriend." Dear white people, same thing. I've already talked about all these movies where they just they just have to have a, a, a white man. It's, it's a desire, something about that. It's self-imposed. That's Jada Crow. That's Jada Crow. That's not J that's not Jamal Crow. Black man ain't doing that to you. But the black man is doing other things to you because the black man isn't accepting you for who you are. All you white, I mean, all you black NFL players who love your white girlfriends at the draft night. 
We've seen it during the Corona shelter in place. We've seen it before. Y'all running around. Antonio Brown, you running around talking about you getting rid of white girls. You you made that statement, and it didn't even last 24 hours. He, he made a statement online on social media saying we dumping all white girls in whatever year he said he was going to dump. When he started acting crazy, when he lost his job and just, just couldn't act right. And then he posted online, we getting rid of all white girls in 2000, whatever. And then the next day, he um, proposed to his daggone white girlfriend. White baby mom. Now she done hit the lottery. She she hit the lottery when she had his first baby. But again, that's that's what I'm talking about. We love giving our money away. Sisters not coming up. They still they still where they're gonna be at, and these white girls are hitting the lottery. Either through hard work, you know, I'm not trying to say that women don't work, either through hard work or they marrying into some money. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods done got divorced. He done wrote a five hundred million dollar check. But I'm digressive. But the point that I'm trying to make is we, we love our light-skinned brothers and sisters here. I love y'all. But the colorism issue has to address. You can't solve your problem with white people. You, you can't even solve your own problem within your own race. So how are we going to solve the problem with white people right now? And if you solve your problem with white people, you still will have a colorism. If you're going to have a, I'm telling y'all, we have a, a potential future Rwanda-type genocide occurring here outside of Africa, outside of the African continent, should I say. And it possibly going to happen here in America when you start having these, uh, we're going to talk, we'll talk, again, like I said, check out my post about these super babies. But let's talk about Jamal Crow and Jim Crow. Jamal Crow and Jim Crow is just basically adopting those, Jamal Crow and Jada Crow, adopting, it's just, the terminology just means you're adopting either Jamal Crow is just black men adopting Jim Crow and or slavery segregation tactics. And Jada Crow is basically the same. It's black women who have black women in power or black men in power who have adopted Jim Crow, Jada Crow type. Of and it's not even really about people in power, but typically we're going to focus on the people in power for this discussion. But it's everyday society. Everyday society, it can be just be a lay person who's adopted this. Cause I'm telling, like I told y'all, I got my my daughter came home in the sixth grade. Sixth grade, how old are you in sixth grade? About eleven. She came home in sixth grade talking about how the kids are walking around comparing skin tones and talking about who's light, who's black as hell, and all this other stuff. It's crazy. Six sixth grade, but and and this isn't anything new, so I'm not surprised by it. Like I say, all of this is a rerun to me. But let's look at some of the stuff that we've done. I'm just going to give a quick exam. I'm not going to try and belabor this um, this um, post right here. Let's look at the colorism issue. And I'm going to, and again, like I said, I'm not trying to pick on um, light-skinned people, man. I'm not, but I'm just looking at it because most of the stuff is done by brown-skinned people. This is the point. Most of the stuff is done by brown-skinned or dark-skinned blacks. And they've elevated the light skin black up to a, a plateau of royalty. I'm telling y'all. So this is really, this really isn't about light skin black. Y'all kind of like a victim in this, but some of y'all, you know, y'all like, Hey, I'll take it. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of this situation. And I wouldn't blame you. Let's look at the colorism issue. I want to talk about a thing. I think I introduced y'all to a term called bona fide operating qualifications. I learned about this in at like, again, I learned about this in college at Howard University in business school. You're going to learn about a thing called bona fide operating qualifications. And basically, if I can recall, because, again, I went through business school a couple of decades ago. Um, and they were basically saying this, you know, we were sitting in class and the teacher was basically explaining it. And it's basically, you know, when you're hiring at an organization, they were basically like, you know, you can't really discriminate against people. When you for your hiring practices, you have to hire, you know, you have to interview candidates like you. You are allowed like as a small business and there's some businesses you're allowed some sort of nepotism up to a amount of number. Like you're allowed like Donald Trump at Trump organizations. He's allowed to hire his son and his daughter. He's allowed to hire his sons, should I say, because he's hired two and his daughter for Trump organization. He's allowed that nepotism because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of other candidates who are far better. I mean, if you search this whole world and I'm not trying to put down Ivanka or Don Jr. or Eric Trump, I'm not putting them people down, but there's always going to be somebody in this world better than you. 
That's just point blank. There's always somebody in this world better. You may think that you're the best, but there's always somebody better than you. And I'm pretty sure that somebody could have challenged and said, hey, you know, hey, I wanted that job that Ivanka has or Don Jr. has or Eric has. But he's allowed some form of nepotism within his business. But then once you get to a certain point, then it becomes, OK, but well, this is then you're in a realm of lawsuit. I'm kind of, you know, I'm. But I think you get the gist. I'm kind of glossing over. I'm not going to get into detail because that's a whole business course. But you're allowed nepotism. Like if you go to your mom and pop stores, it's more than less likely going to be somebody and some family members working the store. He's allowed that form of nepotism. But then at some point, once you get to so many employees, you're not allowed that type of nepotism. But what you are allowed are bona fide operating qualifications. And for bona fide operating qualifications, I'm going to focus in on the entertainment industry because that's what we're going to talk about. But also it provides a good example. So, for example, if I'm having a play, if I'm conducting a play about Harriet Tugman and the life and times of Harriet Tugman, and I've written this play and it's about some slaves. I got 50 slaves in this play. I got Harriet Tugman and I got two slave owners or a slave owner and a slave owner um, and a slave owner's wife. I'm allowed to say, hey, 51 people in my cast are going to be black. They have to be black. So white people can't come in. A white woman can't come in and apply for the part of Harriet Tubman. I can. Well, she can. But if she doesn't get chosen, she really doesn't have a basis to sue me on. Because I can say, hey, look, this person right here has a bona fide operating qualification. She fits the description of the character that needs to be played. I'm hiring for Harriet Tugman. This person right here is a black female that's around 30, 40 years of age. And I'm focusing on Harriet Tugman's ages when she was 30 or 40. And she fits the qualifications. And I've hired in the black and vice versa or versa vice. I cannot. I mean, a, a black person can't get mad if I hire a white person as the slave owner. Because the slave owner is, you know, we're so, he's white. And so I, you can't, you do, you have no grounds to stand on. That's what a bona fide operating qualification is. If I'm, if I'm looking, if I'm hiring Shamu the whale, I'm doing a story on Shamu the whale. I got to find an orca. I can't pick a shark to play that role. An orca has to play that role. That's what a bona fide operating qualification is. If you like Hooters, Hooters is another example. If you have an organization and you're hiring Hooters and you're hiring heavy chested boys, now I'm not trying to say you can get away with this because I'm pretty sure there's some lawyers out there that can probably dis dispute this, but Hooters is hiring on the premise that, hey, look, I'm hiring well endowed, you know, top heavy women to serve chicken wings and beer. And so Hooters may can get around that. But let me, but I'm trying to say Hooters may not can This is 21st century. I don't know. These laws could have changed. But let me give like a, an example. If you've ever seen the movie Oceans 13, this is a good example. The movie Oceans 13 kind of summed it up how people play trickery to introduce bona fide operating qualification. If you've never seen Oceans 13, just basically the premise is Al Pacino's playing this shady um, casino owner so he builds this grand casino that he's having a soft opening for and now the Ocean's 11 team or the Ocean's 13 team they're coming in because Al Pacino kind of wronged one of their people and so they basically make the statement yeah he's trying to go for, he's trying to get like a high rating for his hotel so he knows that this hotel reviewer is coming in to you know rate his hotel to give him either he wants a five diamond he wants to get this diamond award so what he's done is he's hired waitresses, but in order to make sure that his waitresses are all pretty so that his waitresses are all beautiful, he wrote the job description is they are models that serve. So basically they're not really waitresses, they are models, but a part of the model's job duties is to serve drinks and, and food. So that's a way of him trying to skirt around the hiring laws of not not being able to of kind of excluding out maybe undesirable looking females, whatever that may mean. But we know what that means in traditional society. Either she's heavyweight or she, her facial, whatever the facial feature. So he's able to say, I'm hiring models. They're skinny. They have this sleek look to their face or this maybe European look to their face. I don't know. But he's just hiring the prettiest girls 
and he's able to and, and then you see even in the show where the the one lady the the female manager Al Pacino's right hand person she kind of pinches this one girl uses kind of like this device I guess the device that measures your um, body fat ratio or whatever and she pinches her with this device and the girls overweight they have to weigh themselves weekly and if they're over a certain weight they get fired so that's kind of an example of a bona fide operating qualification I think you get it but if you look at the colorism factor and how we do bona fide operating qualifications let's look at some TV shows and some movies right Let, again I want to start off with Oprah Winfrey I know people saying, damn, you keep picking on over. Hey, but I, look, I, I don't make the news. I'm just reporting what I see. Let's look at this movie that she, she was behind, I, I assume. I think she was behind it. I don't know if she di directed or produced it. I know Ava du DuVernay had her name attached to it, too. A Wrinkle in Time. And, and, and there's becoming a pattern with some of these people. I'm telling you, there's a pattern with some of these people. Start doing your background checks on them. A Wrinkle in Time. You looked at this. I didn't. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've never seen the movie. I'm gonna be honest with you. I refuse to go see the movie. I refuse to see it. It's it's free on cable. I refuse to see it. Or it's free on Netflix or YouTube TV or one of the stuff that I have. Disney, Disney Plus. It's on one of these platforms. I know I'm giving y'all shameless plugs, but it's free on one of them. I refuse to watch it because I saw the commercial. I know what it's about already. I may not know the storyline, but all I saw was they introduced the white daddy. I don't even think they introduced a black mama, but these kids had a white daddy and it was a light skinned little black girl. And the little, I guess she had a brother. It was supposed to be her brother. This little kid, look, he was so coach racially mixed. He looked Asian. And then it was another Asian boy that was probably about the same age as the, the light skinned black girl. I guess he may be playing her love interest. Like I said, I don't, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't confirm or deny this. But it looked like maybe they threw in a little interracial love um, love for her, even though she's already light as hell. But what they did was they gave the black girl, they wanted to make it a black movie, but in order to hire a light-skinned black girl and some light-skinned kids, they gave them a white father so that, you know, you can say, hey, look, I'm not trying to say that this is what they intentionally did. I can't, I'm not going to levy those allegations. I'm not letting you know. This is just my theory. This is just my supposition. Is that it was like, okay, we'll give her a light, we'll give her a white father and a black mother. So it has to be an interracial girl that plays this role. Cause she's a she's gonna be a cute little interracial girl with thin hair and or well, you know, fine hair and light skin, Euro features. And then we'll put a little curly haired, little black Asian looking boy in the movie too. And then we get the black a little, you know, and it, it, that's what they did. And then Oprah Winfrey's playing some character look like um one of mystical, mythical type care. I don't know what she's playing. But like I said, all I saw was the trailer, and I already knew that this was not the movie for me to go see. Let's look at Greenlee again. Oprah Winfrey Network. I don't know who the producers and writers are. Or I don't know whose name is assigned to this. As far as the creator, producer, writer, I think I know because we're gonna talk about Queen Sugar too. I think I know who's behind that. Let's look at Greenleaf, though. You got these kids, and there this one preacher daughter comes home. The other two kids are brown as hell. The daughter, I think one of these daughters is a gospel singer, a, real, a gospel singer in real life. Real life. I think so. She she plays like a, a, a her character is just really annoying. But she's brown skin, heavy set, brown skin. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that, but I'm just saying. They got a brown skinned brother. He's brown skinned. Matter of fact, he played in um Why Do I Get Married? Why did I get married? He played um Jill Scott's love interest when her husband, when Richard T. Jones started acting crazy. Richard G, shout out to Richard G. Jones. Richard G. Jones probably hates me because I, I, maybe I'm talking about some of his people. Um, he don't know me from a can of paint, but I'm still gonna shout him out. But you look at he's brown skinned. And he got a brown skinned sister that, that looks, you know, like your traditional black. And then they got a sister that comes home. She's straight hair, long, straight hair. She passes the brown paper bag test or the popsicle stick test, as I like to say. She passes both of those tests. And she passes that Madam C.J. Walker, that comb test. Uh, that ain't the Madam C.J. Walker test. I like calling it Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker created all kind of hair care product. But she's going to pass that comb test. You can run, her, run that comb through her hair and ain't not a kink going to hit it. 
It ain't gonna get caught up in any knot. But again, so now they introduce, and she's playing the lead role, the this 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 lighter skin, straight haired sisters playing this lead role. And not like I said, I don't have anything against her. I'm not. This isn't really about her. I know I'm p- plugging it in. But it's just amazing how the lighter skin people never play the backup roles. They always play the lead roles. And the thing about this movie, where the bona fide operating qualification comes in is not with her. It's with her daughter. So in the, if anybody remembers watching Greenleaf, probably like in the first season, I don't know what episodes it was, but this light, the light skin sister who comes home, she comes home. And she brings this, she has a daughter with her and her daughter is lighter than her. Her daughter is real light skin. Her hair is straighter than her mama's hair. So what they did was in one of the episodes, the the little light skin daughter's father comes to get her because he claimed that the mama brought her back to the Greenleaf family and left the state where they lived in and they broke the divorce decree or something. I may be mixing this up a little bit, but he wanted his daughter back where they came from. And he jumps out the car. He pulls up to the house in a car. He jumps out of the car. He white as hell. I mean, literally, he's a Caucasian, Caucasian male. So again, there's the bed winching factor. They love introduce like, hey, we love sleeping with white men. There's the bed winching factor going on there, but there's, The bona fide operating qualification saying this is why we hired this little girls because she's hired to be light skinned because her daddy's light skinned. And this is bona fide operating qualification. Queen Sugar. Let's move on to Queen Sugar. Another Oprah Winfrey Network production. I'm telling you. Queen Sugar, again, the same premise. The same premise really is Greenleaf, the same playbook. You have three siblings. Two of them are dark skin. I'm talking about like a Hershey dark, beautiful. The, like I told you, the, 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 her, the brother, he had some joker. If I had to pick anybody that I would want to be in the next lifetime or look like, I don't know what his personal life, his personal life may be all jacked up, but if I had to look like somebody in the next lifetime, it would be that young, smooth, chocolate black brother right there. And the sister, like I say, she fine too. I love her hair. Her hair, she has the locks looking, I think she had locks, looking good, fine, chocolate. But the problem is they too chocolate. They chocolate as hell. At least I'm not. Well, let me just say I'm alleging. I think they, they were good enough to get on TV, but they weren't good enough for that lead role because the lead role they gave it to again, another woman who can pass a comb test and a popsicle stick test or a brown paper bag test. Her skin tone is totally different. She doesn't look anything like her brothers and sisters. You know why? Because the story is, and I'm about to give a spoiler alert. Let me give y'all a spoiler alert up front because I think for a couple of the other ones, I never gave a spoiler alert. I just gave y'all the spoiler. Then I gave you the alert afterwards. But the spoiler here was this. Her daddy, she's the half sister of the other two. Her country ass father. This is this is the story that I can't wrap my mind around. Her country ass father from whatever little small town that they from, Louisiana or wherever they at, I don't know where they at. But her country ass daddy, who's a farmer, a sharecropper, went to big time California. I think it was California, it was one of these big time cities, and hooked up with this elite, rich white woman. Had a baby with her. And then he came back to Louisiana to continue farming. That doesn't even make sense. That didn't even make sense. So her mama's riches. See, they love making. See, again, I'm telling you, black people is that J. This is Jada Crow working. This ain't Jamal Crow. This is Jada Crow. Okay, because this is this is I think this is a woman's production. (laughs) This is women's production On, on Queen Sugar. I do believe I do believe. I could be wrong. I'm throwing that in there. I could be wrong, but I do believe this is a woman's production, a woman's creation, a woman's production. 
So again, here it is. We automatically assume white people rich as hell got money and they are so classy and sophisticated because she goes to dinner with her mother. Her mother comes into the show. I came in season two. I got out of this show because I thought this show, the show just got dumber and dumber and dumb. The show started out, the first season started out real good. I will admit, if you watch the first season of Queen Sugar, even the intro song, I think by Michelle and Degay Ocello. Oh my God, the intro song was even hot. And the first season was a nice show. And then it just got dumb to me. Second season, I, I was like, I can't watch this anymore. They got the black, the real dark skinned sister just bed wenching. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about it. We already know that's, see, they, that, that's that Jada Crow. That's that Jada Crow, bed wenching. And then she goes to lunch with her white mama. And her mama's so rich and elite and sitting there. And again, but when it comes to black people, we just downtrod. This is, but this, we, we talking about bona fide operating qualifications though right now. So let's move past Queen Sugar. Let's look at this coon. At least I call him coon. And I shouldn't say that. Maybe I should take that back. I shouldn't say that. So I do apologize to Jared Carmichael. Let me apologize. But it's just his show was just full of coonery. He had a show called The Carmichael Show. Thank God it got canceled. I actually watched this show. I watched the first couple of episodes until I realized what was being done to me. And I said, the joke is insulting me. Now, Tiffany Haddish, this is where Tiffany Haddish and Rel kind of, this is where at least I first get exposure to Tiffany Haddish and Rel. Tiffany Haddish, is, I think had already done so. Well, I don't really get it. I think I've seen her around in little things, but this is where I first really get exposure to, I do believe. And then Lil Rel, this is where I definitely, or Rel, this is where I definitely got exposure to him. Tiffany Haddish is playing the ghetto girl. She's married to Rail on the show. First time she's ever been married to a black person on the TV show in my whole, at least in my existence of seeing her. Every time you see her, she talk about how, being with a white man. And every show you see her, was she was with a white man. So, look, y'all can't blame Cat Williams. Cat Williams didn't lie. Go up, look. If you don't know what I'm talking about when you talk about Cat Williams, look up Cat Williams, Tiffany Haddish. Cat, Cat Williams was not lying. He was not lying on her. And I know Kevin Hart felt as though he needed to defend Tiffany Haddish because they apparently are cool and th that's his, they buddies. But Cat Williams wasn't lying. He wasn't lying. And, and Kevin Hart got his own identity things he can work on too. We'll talk about that. I mean, I ain't going to talk about that one, but I could have put him on that list of people that I did my thing on. But Tiffany Haddish plays the ghetto girl on the Carmichael show. Always talking about stealing something or riding and looting something. You know, just playing a ghetto girl. And then they have this light-skinned girl. I don't even know her name. Don't even want to know her name. She plays Anthony. Of course, she's going to play Jared Carmichael's girl, right? Because Jared is his show. So he, so he gets the light-skinned girl. He gets real Tiffany Haddish. Tiffany Haddish is fine. I will say that. She's she's very pretty. So it was it was win-win for, you know, real. Real one out. But um, Carmichael gets the light-skinned girl. And so just because she's light skinned, they had to have her as having a white daddy because we know all light skinned people come from white people. Right. That's that's what that's the assumption here. That's the assumption. We make these assumptions. Oh, she's light skinned. So we're going to give her a white daddy. Matter of fact, I want to say that on the show, she was part Jewish. So they even took it a step further. Say so she's not only half white, she's a she's Jewish. And on this show, she's a vegan. She she don't know anything about black culture. If you watch this show, this girl knows very little about black culture. She's vegan. She does things totally different and supposedly, quote unquote, more sophisticated. And then you got Jared Carmichael and, you know, um, Loretta Devine plays the mother and at David Allen Greer. And, you know, they're not as refined as this white girl and her family. I'm being serious. I don't make this up. And definitely Tiffany Haddish is just totally hood on the show. This white girl so vegan, so proper. I mean, this light-skinned girl so vegan, so proper, everything. This is colorism. And not only colorism, but and then I'm just pointing out the bona fide operating qualification of plugging in a uh, light-skinned girl and they had to make her half white. So that way you had to hire a light-skinned girl. It's, it's, it's something. This is something. We, we go through this a lot we go through it a lot they do the field nigger versus house negro syndrome excuse me for saying the n-word i do apologize 
but you do the field Negro versus the house Negro syndrome. You have the light skinned female blacks. They have those European names, right? And then the dark skinned female blacks, they have, they play. And, and, and not only do the light skinned female blacks have European names, but they get the upper class roles, right? They play a more upper class roles, you know, or middle, like even middle class, upper class, but they're playing more civilized characters. Whereas your, your darker skinned female blacks tend to play your lower class roles. They live in, you know, the lower part of the hood, whatever hood it's in, whether it's Southside Chicago, Southeast DC, Watts, Compton, whereas these lighter skinned girls live in, you know, whatever classy neighborhoods they are, whether that be Northwest DC, Georgetown, Friendship Heights, DuPont Circle. Y'all familiar with DC? But even though they don't never have a show on D in DC neighborhoods, they never have a show in DC. But they're but they're from these middle class, upper class neighborhoods, right? And you know the the, the light skin ones, and and the, and the dark skinned girls, they just get these secondary roles. I'm I'm not joking. So, and just also, I just want to talk about colorism just real quick because I kind of. Introduce colorism, talking about it with as far as bona fide operating qualifications. But I think you get the gist with bona fide operating qualifications. But let's look at colorism, how it affects the music industry. I'm just focusing on colorism there. This is more Jamal Crow because this is what men do. Men, black, the black man has been pathetic, really, since slavery ended. The black man has really been pathetic. And so, you know, I kind of understand why the sisters are doing what the sisters are doing. But black man, you, 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 we, we're, we are, we are. I'm going to throw a we because I'm a part of it. I mean, I don't think that I've been doing this, but I'm not going to, I can't disassociate myself from a black man because I'm a black man. But let's look at music. There was, I'm just going to give a few examples. I don't even, I'm not even talking about, like, like if you look at current, look, the current music industry as a whole. Let's look at the current music industry as a whole. You know, you don't even really see that many brown skin female singers. And again, I'm not trying to pit brown, brown skin girls against light skin girls. And I'm not talking bad about light skin women because we uh, we love light skin women just love we, much as we love brown skin and dark skin women. But I'm just saying that we have a psychological problem where we think being light is being better or being right. You can't go into the uh, a, a, a music industry and find a brown skinned woman, really. I mean, Summer Walker's out there. I think H E R and come to find out this is what's been alleged. I'm, this is an allegation. I'm not trying to say that it is true, so don't take this as being true. They said that they some H E R, not Summer Walker, but H E R was taking pictures of some, I guess, supplements that she was taking, and amongst those supplements was some. Skin lightning pills. I'm not trying to say it's true or not. I'm just trying to say that that was an allegation. But see, that's what we force brown skin girls to do. We force little Kim to do that because obviously she felt as though, and maybe there was just something psychologically messed up with her, like with Michael Jackson. But she felt the need to that she wasn't getting the attention or love that she was getting being a brown skin girl, and she had to change her look. There's been allegations against Nicki Minaj brown lightening her skin. I'm not trying to say it's true or not. I'm just giving you the facts. Girls in Africa are doing it. It is sad. This is really sad. The but the, this is the media. But the reason why I'm focusing on the media because people need to understand the power of the media. Where most people get imp get impressions and learn from is from looking at things on television. Television reinforces a lot of things and music. Music enforces a lot of things. If all you see running around doing music videos of light skinned girls with long hair or white girls with long hair, what do you think that brown skinned girls are going to do if they have no representation and they're not viewed as being pretty and being idolized? That's all I'm saying. But the music executives have done this. Well, I'm not going to focus on the white men. We've already talked about them. We know what their complicity has been. And they've probably been the ones who actually started this. But we have continued the practice. We've continued the practice. Look at, look at, um, y'all probably don't remember this, but LL Cool J. 
LL Cool J had a song. And I'm not trying to say that he was the one to do this. I don't know who did it because I don't work in the music industry. So I don't know whether this was LL Cool J's call or whether this was a director's call or whether this was, or maybe this was some, the, the girl who originally did the song was not available. So they had to plug in another girl. I don't know what the procuring calls around this was. But LL Cool J had a song called Doing It. Doing it, doing it, doing it well. I represent Queen. She was raised out in Brooklyn. I love that song. I love LL Cool J. LL Cool J was like my favorite rapper. They used to call me a New York Bama in DC. I'm just kind of digressing. I, I was in the rap since 1980. Since 80. I was I was a New York fan. DC didn't DC wasn't into rap back then. Just a quick fact for y'all. DC was not into rap. Not not 90% of the city, everybody else was in the go-go. Chuck Brown, Red Essence, Air Raid, my Trouble Funk. My cousins played in, actually, I think, Essence and Air Raid. Or Air Raid and Trouble Funk. One of them had a cousin that played for Air Raid. But I'm telling you, Chuck, Chuck Brown, the Soul Surgers, or Chuck Brown, Air, Red Essence, Air Raid, Trouble Funk, Lil Benny, all them bands. Junkyard band then came along, of course. Um, but you know, they they used to look at me and be like, "Oh, you a New York Bama? You like that New York?" I, I I was just, I mean, I like, I listened to Go Go a little bit. I did like, yeah, I did specifically Chuck. But other than that, I was in the rap. And LL Cool J was my man, and he had a song called "Doing It," doing it, doing it, and doing it well. The original girl that did the song, I think, was Lashawn. And if you ever saw a picture of LaShawn, she's a heavy set brown skinned girl, I do believe. You know, look, there is a whole other debate too on who's light skinned and who's brown skinned. Because there's some girls that call themselves light skinned, and I'm looking at them like, you ain't light skinned. And then there's some girls, that, you know, so there's a whole fine line. That, that's a whole different conversation. People have debates. I heard, I just saw online where people were debating whether Rihanna was light skinned or brown skinned. I, I can't tell you. I don't even know what Rihanna looked like because I don't pay attention to her. She don't do my type of music. No, no offense. I mean, pretty sure she's a great artist. But, I, you know, maybe I need to check out a picture of her. But people had debates all the time about black people and who's light. Who, I told you my kids, looking at Clay, they told my daughter she's like a light brown skin. She's, she's a light brown skin. She ain't light skin. She just light brown. She almost did. That's what I guess they told her. I don't know. But... LL Cool J, getting back to LL Cool J, like I said, this girl LaShawn, I think she was heavy set and she was brown skinned. From at least from the picture that I can recall, whether it was from one of them, I don't know, you know, one of them magazines that we used to have, write on magazines or whatever the heck. I don't know. Then there was, you know, the Source Awards and I meant the Source Magazine and Vibe. I don't know. One of the magazines could have had her in there. Well, I probably saw a picture of her. Or she was on the um, cover of one of them songs. But. In the video, I don't think you saw the song. It was a light skinned girl, I do believe, with LL Cool J, and she was kind of humming the parts to LaShawn's part. I'm telling you, she wasn't in that video. And I mean, we can speculate why she wasn't in the video. I'm just speculating. But it just doesn't look right. The colorism, it doesn't look right. Why couldn't LaShawn be in the video as herself? Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones had an album. Fresh Off the Block. Was it Fresh Off the Block? I don't know. I could be getting that wrong. But look it up. He had a song. And I, and I got the album, too. I love the album. Um, he had a song on there called Slow Jams. And it was the song was with Babyface and Coco from SWV. I mean, this is just true facts. Like, again, I don't know what the procure. I don't know the history. Again, I'm not in the music industry, so I cannot tell you why these people did what they did or do what they do. I cannot. But he had a song called Slow Jams that, you know, he, that he had um, Babyface singing along with it was a duet with Coco from SWV. And if anybody knows SWV, Coco is brown skin. She long hair, brown skin. When the video came out. The song was with, they redid the vocals, and it was, I think, Babyface and Tamia. Grant, if you don't know who Tamia is, that's Grant Hill's wife. First place you're going to actually hear Tamia, at least the first place I actually heard Tamia, and I don't know if this is true, I could be wrong. I think, did Quincy Jones discover her? I think she's Canadian. 
But the first place I heard her was on Quincy Jones's album. This album that I'm talking about, I'm fresh off the block. And she did a song called You Put a Move on My Heart. I do believe this this was the album. I could be get my facts wrong, but that's a for she did a song on it. Basically, Quincy Jones, if you all know him, he's just really the producer behind stuff. And then he just he created an album with everybody singing on his album. You know, got stars. He he had um in the garden or I forget the name of it in the garden. James Ingram, Elder Barge, um Barry White. I'll be sure. But then that was my that's my jam too. But I'm just focusing on this one song, Slow Jams. I'm just wondering why when the video came out, Tamia's vocals was on there and she was doing it with Babyface and it wasn't Coco. Again, maybe Coco was sick and she couldn't do the video. Maybe they needed them vocals. They needed this video done and maybe they needed they told Tamia go in there, drop these vocals and let's do this video. I don't know. Or maybe it was the, the thing that I feared it, it is. They, they were just like, when we do the video, we need a better visual. Um, you know, we need somebody that's less urban looking, less less hood looking, uh, or, you know, looks more appealing to white people. I don't know what these people say. But I hope it was just she wasn't available. Or maybe, maybe her and Quincy had a fall. I don't know. I don't know what the reason was. But I'm just basically giving you the information that it's amazing how these brown skin girls are getting stripped off of songs that they've made popular and then they just plug in a light skin girl to for the visual kelly price had an unsung on t if you all watch tv one i love tv one that's the only reason why i have not given up my k i got about fifty nine thousand subscriptions to cable channels i swear i swear i do i got my cable Running through my cable subscriber, which I got about 900 channels that show nothing, absolutely nothing. Absolutely, there'll be days I turn on and I flip through all 900 channels, and I'm like, damn, there's not something on that I want to watch. 900 channels for real? So I got 900 channels that I'm paying about a couple hundred dollars a month for. Then I got my YouTube TV, which is just my local channels, and I just get that for TVs that aren't patched into my cable because I got smart TVs throughout the house. Then I got Disney Plus, we got Amazon Prime, Netflix, my wife done added Hulu. It's like, what? We, we got about 38,000 subscriptions here. I'm digressing though. Good Lord, I'm digressing. But the reason why I haven't given up my cable channel is because none of, like, if I can't lose TV One, that's the only black station really we have, TV One and Aspire. BET ain't no black TV channel. That's Viacom. But TV One, I at least want to give um, Shorty some of my money and support her and also aspire, but really TV One. And she occasionally, she, I mean, she has some good shows. Her program's getting better. The program is really getting better. But we got to we gotta continue to support our channels and, 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 and help them get better programming. And she's getting there. She really is. Got nice original pro, um, original movies that they've been doing. But I'm digressing. But that's the reason why I haven't gotten rid of my cables because TV, none of this other stuff has TV One. But TV One has a show called Unsung. And Unsung did it Unsung on Kelly Price. I do believe it was TV One. I hope I've got my facts straight um, that did this. And, and on that sh- um, thing, on that program, and she talked about how some music executives said because I think her album was dropping the same day as Maya's album. And she said that the music executives had a bet between one another. And this one music executive said, I bet you my light skin, pretty black girl beats out your big, fat, dark skin girl. I'm not, I'm paraphrasing this. I'm paraphrasing. I'm kind of close. I'm paraphrasing, but I didn't say it. This this isn't words out of my mouth. This is words out of her mouth. And this and, and maybe this is and this is her truth. So I'm just repeating her truth. This is her truth, and maybe she got her facts wrong. I don't know, but I highly doubt Kelly Price got, Price got her facts wrong. I don't think that she lied. To, she don't seem like a person that would lie about something like that. But the point that I'm making is this is the colorism that goes on. And shows why we keep suppressing our own people down. 
The next part of Jamal Crow and or Jada Crow that I want to talk about is with our black lexicon. And particularly the N word. We we just can't. And as you heard, now I did slip up in this um, broadcast and I do apologize when I was referring to field Negroes and house Negroes. But we have to at some point in time, we have to get past using that word. We just do. We just do. We can't. We It's like. It's like we've accepted it. We, we use it so much and it's so pervasive, so ubiquitous throughout our lives. We just say, oh, F it. We just going to adopt the word. And then we try to say stupid stuff to account for how we use it. I'm saying N-I-G-G-A. I didn't say N-I-G-G-E-R. I said N-I-G-G-E-A. There's a difference. One of them is a racial term. One of them is a racial slur. And you should never say that. But the other one, that's just a term of endearment. Are we? This is the psychological damage that I'm talking about. This is foolishness at its best. You want to make a dark mirror episode? That's a dark mirror episode for your ass. What? That's a good dark mirror episode. That's very sci-fi. But we can't get past using the N-word. It's something I know. I mean, even look, we had a, even a black president who's admitted, hey, I use the word. And look, I'm proud of him for admitting it because it that just goes to show you how pervasive it is in our um, in our dialogue and our, in the black lexicon. I'm being serious. You know, we just have been adopted to use that word. I mean, not adopted, but we it's just been a part of our conversation. It's part of what you hear. You can't expect white people. Now, that's why white people be complaining. Like, why can't I use that word? Because they hear it so much, especially if you got black friends and you around your black friends and all you hear, you'll hear that N word thrown around about 500 times. If you are around black people, you may hear 29,000 times in a day. If you're around the wrong black people, like these, some of these rappers, it, 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 oh, that's all they use. That's what, how they address each other. It's sad. <laughs> but I mean, just looking at it like this. It's gotten so bad. We got singers singing the word. <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it's gotten. I mean, I like Donnell Jones. Trust me, Donnell Jones made good music, but he has a song. And if you got to don't lie, you ain't got to talk to me. You know, he, he got, I'm telling you, he, he has a song and he sings the song and he did it on more than one record. More than one record. He's sung the N word. Sean Stockman from Boys to Men. We're talking about clean cut, polished Boys to Men. He had a song where he used the word in it. He sings the word. Chris Brown's done it. I do believe he's done it. I may or may be wrong on that one, but I do believe he's done it. The Dream has done it on his favorite song, Rocking That Thing. Tell your girls, holla back, tell you. I'm a Timmy. Holla back to your girls. Good night. The way you rocking that up in the club, I swear you're going to make a fall in love. And they singing it. This is R&B. Supposed to be smooth, talking about love. They sing the word. You got black girls that sing the word. My came home to me. You know, they sing the word. This is craziness. We'll never get rid of this word. I mean, we don't even need to talk about the rappers that use the word. How are you a rapper? I heard one time Kendrick Lamar had to pull the microphone from a girl and tell her she can't use the word. Well, I guess they handed the microphone to some white girl in the audience and let her sing. You know how sometimes rappers are passing around. I'm saying I heard this. I don't know if it's true or not. But, you know, and then I guess she sang the song. and She sang the song the way he wrote the song. That's the sad part about it. She didn't put the word in the song. And of course, you know, music is like, music puts you in a special mode. Music has had special vibrations to it. You know, you just hear a song and you love it so much. I sing anything. If I love the song so much, I mean, hell, Satan could come out with a song. If the song was hot, he could have me saying all kinds of stuff in that record. I'd be talking about God and the universe. I'd probably talk about my own mama if the song was hot. And I really loved it that much. But that's the problem. I shouldn't be loving a song if, if the song is that detrimental to me. 
But that's the point that I'm trying to make. You can't expect white people to not use the word. And you don't got it littered all in your songs. And your music is tight. So how can you get mad and lecture a white person for singing lyrics that you wrote? And they supposed to self-censor themselves. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. I'm just being honest with you. We even had a rapper. I think it's Snoop's cousin. I think they cousins. That N-word Daz. That that's the name is that's his name. Dat D A T Dat N word Daz. And then he just goes by Daz Dillinger. I'm not no and you throw it in your name and I think he I think I read one time that he said he was at a mall and a little white kid recognized it and the white kid hollered out that that's that N word Daz. Well what you want to, I mean Jesus Christ, what you want the white kid to do? I don't think he was offended or nothing, but and that's that's also another issue. But why would you even name yourself that? It just also showing you how pervasive the, the, the N-word is in our vocabulary. This joker, Terrence Howard, this joker, he, want, he wanted to use the N-word on the empire to make the show more realistic. <laughs> he wants to make the show more realistic. He wants to make the show more realistic. So on Empire, he wants everybody to just use the, the N word. I guess he just wanted the N word to be littered around on the show. Well, if you want to make the show realistic, why not use the F word? We could use the F word on the show for, for homosexuals. And the G word. The G word, I guess that's not a, a slur. Why not use the F word on the show? He won't, they won't go there. They won't go there. That's what Terrence Howard will draw the line. No, 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 no. We can't do that. That is disrespectful. But calling each other N words, that's realistic. And, you know, hey, that's what we are. That, that's, the, that's the attitude. I mean, think about the logic and the psychology on it. You should want to say this is to be a place and a proven ground where we, through the media, can wipe this word out and hopefully eliminate it from people's usage. Make it frowned upon. The media has that type of control and power. But again, we're talking about Jada Crow. We're talking about Jamal Crow. The people who have the power to make the change, and they're not going to make this change. Let's, I mean, I want to look at a little bit of coonery here. And I'm not going to spend time on coonery because that's another form of Jamal Crow. Just like, you know, when you looked at Wealth of Nations, um, the original, um, I mean, not, not Wealth of um, Birth of a nation. I'm talking about wealth of nation. That's not wealth of nation. I'm talking about birth of a nation. Wealth of nation is more economic book. Birth of a nation, the original birth of a nation. I'm not talking about the one about Nat Turner. I forgot the young brother who did that movie. That movie actually pretty good. If you see birth of a nation with the young, I forgot the, his name. He did movies with, um, he did a movie with Denzel Washington. I think, I don't know if that was a Spike Lee movie, but he did a movie with Denzel Washington. Um, and some young kid named Denzel Whitaker, the great debaters. Good, good movie, good movie. But this young dude did a movie and it got overshadowed by some Me Too type of incidences that he supposedly did. Great movie. I thought it was an outstanding movie. If you have a chance to see Birth of, Birth of a Nation, go watch it. But there's an original Birth of a Nation back in the early days where even the president showed it at the White House and where they just make you look like savages. And then they have all these other movies where they show y'all eating watermelons with your eyes all bugged out and your lips poked out and talking all slow. I'm telling you, we have some of them same movies in 2000X, 2000X, whichever, Y2X, I'll just call it Y2X. Marlon Wayans is in a lot of it. He's in a lot of it. He, he kind of perpetuates it. I know people going to get mad at me for talking about Marlon. Y'all must love Marlon. Marlon loved doing stuff. They'll throw a TMZ camera in his face. And I, threw, I, I remember one time seeing him on TMZ and they were asking him about something about white, black people. And he said, nobody wants to see your black face in the camera going like, Ooh. and then he made a little black face where he bugged his eyes out and bugged his lips out. Just, just a bunch of coonery. He does a lot of coonery. He likes taking TV shows. I think he's, made his niche off they saw how um popular um those those movies those scary movies that they him and his family used to do and then he they start running off with all these movies 
you know, parodying these famous movies and just basically making us look bad. I would say the N-word eyes and I would say it, but he does a lot of it. We do coonery in shows. And then the final place was where we have Jamal Crow and Jada Crow popping up is in our own employment. We, we just just as far as how we treat each other in the employment workspace. It's pretty it's it's we do Jamal Crow. We do Jim Crow, Jamal Crow all day long, all day long. I'm being honest with you. Def Jam, Def Jam Records. You, you know, black people are good enough to be your artist. They're not good enough to be your executive. Russell Simmons. Seriously, Russell Simmons. This is the chance when you, when black people, like I told you, black people, we don't own any industry. We do not own or control any industry. We do not own or control any industry. We we may have an owner at the top and then he'll hire he or she. Cause I don't know what Oprah Winfrey staff look like. I know what her staff looked like when she had that Oprah Winfrey show on a major network and it wasn't you. It wasn't us, you know, but I'm telling you, Russell Simmons, all the meditate. This is this the, the I'm gonna tell you the thing that gets me about Russell Simmons. This is what gets me about Russell Simmons. I used to have a lot of respect for Russell, seriously, because I, you know, I wanted, like I told y'all, I wanted to be a mogul. I wanted to have my own empire coming up. That's what I wanted to be a business person. Goes to show you, dream deferred, dream deferred. Because ain't nobody messing with me. I'm I'm plutonium. These companies, they won't touch me. So now I've resorted to doing stuff like this. But what I'm trying to say is this. Russell Simmons used to, I used to really admire the dude until I got older and my eyes started opening up. Here's a man, like I told y'all, marries a black woman of, of Japanese descent, but a black woman nonetheless. Names all his kids Japanese names. Don't, none of, don't, don't respect his own culture. <laughs> she, don't, uh, I mean, she obviously don't respect her black culture, I guess. Names these kids Japanese names. He's sitting around the house meditating all day long, talking about how he a vegan, how he meditating. I guess, I don't know if he a Buddhist or not, but he does all this, like he's so spiritual. And then I see him on, I think it's on Netflix. He's either on Netflix or something when they talk about hip hop. Like when they talk about, the, they run through like how hip hop was started and hip hop was born. And he dropped more in words in, he, he, he didn't even talk. He probably talked maybe for about 30 seconds. And in a 30 second time, he dropped maybe about 25 in words. So that means you, you, that means almost every second you would drop an N word. And I may be exaggerating with that, but it's just to say, it's like, how do you become meditative? Like who does that? Who meditates? Who's a vegan? Who claims they're so spiritually aligned with the universe and drops 35,000 because nobody wants to be in and the niggas, but when, and then, excuse me for using the name word, I do apologize. I just, but that, I'm just imitating Russell Simmons. Russell Simmons. And, 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 and I'm like, what? First, it's just an embarrassment. Just an embarrassment. But going on up again, just getting back to the point is that. When you own a business, a part of the black consciousness should be, let me look for the best and brightest black talent. You can't tell me. I mean, Howard University has been in existence since 1868. I don't make this up. That's what's on my sweatpants since 1868. I wasn't around during that time to know whether they telling the truth or not. I ain't coming around to 19, 1970s. But I, I can only take their word that they've been in existence since 1868. Hampton, Delaware State, Bowie State, Norfolk State, North Carolina Central, North Carolina a and Spelman, Clark, Morehouse, Tuskegee. I can go on and on. There are 100,000 black university. That's an exaggeration. There are thousands of black universities. In the United States of America. And if you don't want to go to, okay, let's just say these kids aren't at black university. Let's say they went to a PWI, a predominantly white institution. There are black kids there too. You mean to tell me you couldn't find out one that could intern at your company that you could promote up and say, this person is a future executive. They're going to run Def Jam. You turn it over to Lyra Cohen. I don't make this up. I don't make this up. 
BET, look, I'm going to say this. I don't know what they were doing at BET. I don't know what his hiring staff looked like. I lived in D.C. I lived in Washington, D.C. I lived down the street from the BET studios. When, when, when BET was in D.C., before they moved out of D.C. to New York, I think they moved to New York when they left D.C., but they started off, it's a D.C., they, they were founded and started here in Washington, D.C. I do believe they, were, I'm not going to say founded, but they, they had headquarters here in Washington, D.C., right in Northeast. I don't make this up. Right off Brentwood Road. I do believe off Brentwood Road. If you're ever in Northeast, D.C., you go to Brentwood Road. They right behind the McDonald's over there, right, right near the post office. My neighbors worked at BET. Like I told you, the, the running joke in D.C. This was the running joke, at least in my neighborhood. I don't know if anybody else heard it. The running joke was if you was light-skinned, you'd get a job at BET. That was the word. If you was a light-skinned, specifically a light-skinned female, if you a light-skinned female, you get a job at BET. That's the running word. Now, there may be some truth to that because if you look at his wife, his wife's light-skinned. Or his ex-wife. Now his ex-wife, she runs Salamander Resort down right outside D.C., she helped co-found. She was co-founder of BET. She co-founded. I do believe it was her parents' money that gave him his start. I do believe that's the case. Don't hold me to that. Don't say that that is true. That Don't say that that's gospel. But his wife is a light skin. She passed that comb test and that um, brown paper bag test. Popsicle test. I'm telling you. I don't know what the hiring practices were. I, so, But if you looked at Ananda Lewis, Ananda Lewis, brown skin, but she passed that she passed that comb test. You look at some of the people that they put on their television set. So, I mean, behind the scenes, from what I'm hearing, was that you had to be. And then there's another little mogul coming up right now. He done hired somebody to run his company. A little light skin. She looked Puerto Rican to run his company. Because he's thinking what is ding a -ling. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you are a pretty woman, you can go far in this world. I swear to God, if you are, if you are a pretty woman of mixed background, light skin, if you light skin in this world, you can go a far way. But again, I'm not beating up on my light skin um, sisters. We love you. But at the same time, we, we notice the pattern. It's a pattern. And the other thing, too, when I'm talking about hiring is we don't even hire one another when we work in other establishments. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I work for an institution and I'm going to tell you in there, black people specifically, what they do is they love hiring black females and um, where I work at, they don't, they, they don't discriminate brown skin, female, light skin, female, dark skin, female. They'll promote you up because you're a female, you're a black female, you check off two minority boxes, you check off black, you check off female. And the other important thing too is they don't, they, I'm not going to say fear you, because I'm not trying to say they fear the black man, but they know that you're non-aggressive, you're not threatening, you're not as a, you're not as much of a threat as a black man. I think they feel as though that most people, I'm going to tell you like this, and I'm going to say this for another post, most people, Managers, when they when they start looking for management, managers, management material, they start looking for people not who are qualified. They start looking for people who they want to be around, because when you're a manager and you have to work with other managers, you have to have a lot of meetings together. That means you have to interact with a lot of you have to interact a lot. Like if you notice, most people don't interact with their managers that like upper management that much. You interact with your floor manager, your direct manager. Mostly. You don't interact with the other people. The other people come around when they want to sell you. They, they pimp you. They treat you like a pimp treats hoes. I'm just being honest. They come around when they want you to buy into something. So they come around to tell you, see, I see you. I hear your problems. My door is always open. Just come talk to me. And they, give you the, they give you that talk. To, they give you just enough attention and FaceTime with them to make you buy in and work harder and push yourself and be committed to staying and working for the company and fulfilling their business objective. But they're not going to give you enough time and or attention to talk with you and, and be your friend or just to listen to you. I'm just being honest. You're not there to be your friend, but just, they're not going to give you that much time and attention. And so when they start looking for people to be management material, if you notice, most organizations have their own management program. 
In order to become a manager, you have to go through the XYZ Corporation's management program. And you sit there being like, well, I got a damn bachelor's degree and a master's degree in management. And I used to be a manager. I got a lot of qualifications to be a manager. Why do I need to go through your program? Well, because our program teaches you how to become a manager in this. No, what it is is that they go and get information from other people in the organization to say, how's this person? Do we want to be around this person? I don't know about this person. And it's a good way for them to promote who they want to promote. That's the bottom line. I can do a whole discussion on that, but that's in my book. Y'all read my book on my life story and how they and how they treated me. Boy, my life story is fantastic when it comes to, it's, and not in a good way. When I say fantastic, it is something else. It is a good read when you read my professional trials and tribulations. I'm going to put that book out. No, I've tried to pitch it to various literary agents. And they were like, oh, we don't want to read that. I don't want to promote that. I couldn't get a literary agent to publish it. I didn't want to self-publish it because all it's going to do is do like my other self-published books and sell probably about 30 copies and to go away. I didn't make any money off my other publications. I made beer money off my other publications. Not not even beer money, just a six-pack money. One six-pack. Seriously. You put books out there on Amazon and stuff, them books ain't going, your e-books ain't going to sell. I made like $2. I would get royalty money like $2 this month. $6 Six dollars this month, a dollar fifty this month, thirty eight cent this month, four dollars a month. Yeah. Self publishing, at least for me, it didn't work. So I was trying to take that other book, you know, because I thought I had a story to tell. But because it's, it was a racial story, but maybe now in post George Floyd, it's it's probably, you know, something that needs to come out. But I'm saying all that to say this: these people are not going to hire you. And they're going to hire a black female. And that black female, when she gets there, I'm telling you, it's that bed wenching syndrome. And black people have another a water cooler syndrome. We don't gather no more than two or three blacks in a in a, in a um, open space, either at the water cooler or in somebody's cubicle. If a fourth one show up, somebody got to leave. I'm telling you. And so I'm saying all that to say this is that when that black female gets promoted up, she looks down on the other blacks, particularly black men. The black sisters, they tip, they seem like they stick together. Even though I've heard some black females be like, I have a hard time with that black woman. Oh, I have a hard time. But they seem like they stick together. But they don't, but they black men, they look at you like you shiftless, lazy. And you be like, what? You know, I'm telling you, we don't, we don't help each other in other people's establishments. We just don't. So that's all I wanted to say about this Jamal Crow and Jada Crow. I'm telling you, Jim Crow, he may still be around. And black people, y'all may still say Jim Crow still here. But y'all need to start talking about Jamal Crow and Jada Crow. Because at some point in time, you have to understand that your white problems are going to probably be here forever. It's a yin and a yang. Black and white are two polar opposites, two contrasting. Two contrasting cultures, two contrasting um, physical appearances. One on one spectrum, one on the other. I'm not trying to say one's good, one is bad. I'm just trying to say you're on polar opposites. You're on polar opposites. Your problems are going to always be here. This George Floyd thing ain't solving anything. It's going to solve something temporarily until the next issue comes up. And what good may come out of this is, you know, some people may start getting promotions. Some people are going to benefit individually. Like you're going to start seeing some individual. Let's promote John up. Let's, let's promote Darnell up. Make this thing look good. You see all this Juneteenth. Uh, now every company wants to celebrate Juneteenth. Really? Black people don't even celebrate Juneteenth. I celebrate Juneteenth. But black people don't even celebrate Juneteenth. And they'll accept it now to the white man accepting it. Now black, because black people do whatever the white man tell them to do. The white man shapes and controls us. But what I'm trying to say on this um, post right here is that you got bigger problems than Jim Crow. You got Jamal Crow and Jada Crow working on you too. And whatever Jim Crow puts you through, like I told you, because you can always have a problem with white people. Whatever he puts you through, if you stick together, if you promote your own, if BET promotes its own, if TV One promotes its own and actively seeks its own, go through pipelines and say, we're going to use these black universities and we're going to hire these black people to run our companies and pay them good, pay them good salaries. 
if you look at these back black football players and black basketball players and they say I'm gonna get me be I'm gonna get behind some black franchises not just my friends not just my buddies I'm not gonna give them money and they came from certain backgrounds with me and they don't have any business acumen. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna get behind some young people some black people some smart people who want to start businesses who are smart enough to do so and I'm gonna back them and if that business fails, I'm still going to keep backing a black business because businesses fail. If we get behind and start supporting one another and we stop doing this colorism, these bona fide operating qualifications to one another, we get rid of the N word out of our um, vocabulary. We stop cooning and self hating. Talk about, see, I told y'all them black people aren't going to do nothing and stop being self defeatist. We can actually do something. We have we have a lot of black people that can help do so. Michael Jordan, even though he ain't, I, I have this zero faith that Michael Jordan helped you do anything in your lifetime. Oprah Winfrey, I have little faith in Oprah Winfrey, but I have more faith in her than I do. Um, oh, Michael Jordan. You have a lot of blacks. Um, oh, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson's always been rocking in the community. I don't know if he's giving us jobs, but I know his businesses are in the community. You have a lot of blacks out there who can do Tyler Perry definitely can do something. Put your money where your mouth is. Help you. You can spearhead it. And this unfortunate. That's the unfortunate part too. Is that the unfortunate part is we always have to rely on celebrities to bail us out. We don't have any black brain trust outside of the celebrity sphere. But that's for a different post. This is Political Brown Kid. I'm signing out. Just continue to um, check out my content. And if you want to support me, definitely look on um, all of the platforms that I'm on to financially support me and or just to spread the word. I do appreciate you listening today. Peace.